All right, there we go. It is, well, 2 p.m. in Eastern time, 6 a.m. where I am because I'm in Australia and that's a terrible time zone to be in. Um, so welcome everybody. This is not only the first Business Agility Symposium, this is also the first event for the Business Agility Institute. Um, since well, the Business Agility Conference that we had last year was an independent event and now we're creating this institute to around it. Um, for the next 90 minutes, we're going to be exploring the somewhat complicated and uh, confusing domain that is Agile talent. We have three fantastic people here to spread, to shed some light on it and give, give us a bit of awareness of what HR, I mean, all, nobody likes calling people resources, so we'll try and limit the use of that term but what does hr what does talent what the what do people look like in an agile organization how does that work so we're going to be spending uh the the, the format of this event is a little bit unique we will start with a uh, three each of the three speakers will spend about 15 minutes talking about their topic all right, for Fabiola, it's going to be, and I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, talent summarization. Pia Maria will talk about motivation and Marsh will talk about curiosity. And all of this is about how we engage and how we build an agile workforce. But for those of you who were at the conference last year, the Business Agility Conference, you'll know that we don't like just learning from the front of the room or the front of the screen as the case is in this, in this instance. Rather, we would prefer that each of you actively participate. And this is where the deep dive comes into play. What we will do is uh, somewhere towards the top of the hour, towards the top of the hour, over the uh, three o'clock your time, seven o'clock my time, um, we will open up the panel for everybody. We're gonna spend about half an hour, between 45 minutes and half an hour, on your stories, your questions, your challenges and problems. Uh, each of you um, in Zoom, there's the option to raise your hand. Right? When you raise your hand, I will promote you so that you can so that you can speak and you can speak to the audience. Please, no self promotion. I don't want five minutes of who you are and why you're a wonderful person. Let's just take that as a given. Um, hi, I'm so and so. That's fine. And then say something meaningful it can be a question hey fabiola when you mentioned in talent summarization about x y and z could you just explain a little bit about something right? it can be a challenge right? um pia maria how would you solve this problem i i, I have a challenge in my organization where uh, our employees aren't responding to surveys let's make it up right how would you solve that problem get their advice or you can share a little story. It's like, I had something very similar and we solved the problem by X, Y, and Z. And as we invite more people onto the screen, I'll we'll try and limit to about four additional panelists and as a fifth comes in, I'll knock somebody off. But these are questions and these are conversations for everybody. Don't just think that the three panelists here are special. They are special, right? but everyone's a little bit special. That sounds kind of wrong. But uh, you, you get my point. Uh, feel free to talk and ask questions and answer questions as the case may be. So without further ado, uh, we are about five minutes in. Um, I'd like to introduce Fabiola to give us the first talk. She's going to be touching on talent summarization, the employee experience in agile enterprises. And I'll be honest, this is a new word for me as well. So I'm really curious. I've known Fabiola for a couple of years. I think we met, actually, I think we might have met in India um, at one of the conferences there a couple of years ago. You spoke at the Business Agility Conference last year on well, HR, what other topic. So uh, I really hope you enjoy her talk as much as I do. Fabiola, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, Fabiola, we can't hear you. Kevin, you unmuted everyone. Aha, there we go. Okay. So, um, can I share my presentation, Evan? Please do, yeah. I think you have to open it up for, for me to share. 
Oh, do I? Yeah. We were testing this earlier. No, it's you should be able to share now. All panelists can share. We were literally testing this like five minutes before everybody joined and now it's not working. There we go. <laughs> Over to you, I'll go on to mute. Thank you. So 88% of employees worldwide um, are disengaged, disillusioned and dissatisfied by that work. And that at a time when we really depend on the intrinsic motivation um, of people. But let me take you on a little journey and put that number, those 88%, into a slightly different context. So I take you back to um, January 26, 2014. It's a bitter cold Sunday afternoon in New York, and I'm heading to Yankee Stadium, which is the baseball um, stadium in New York. Um, and for the first time ever in the tri-state area, an NHL game is being played the way hockey games are, are supposed to be played outdoors. And I'm a big fan, a Rangers fan, so um, my team, the New York Rangers, are hosting the New Jersey uh, Devils um, on this cold Sunday afternoon. And as you can imagine, it was an amazing event. Uh, people were cheering, they were, they were having a great time. And I was just sitting there, taking it all in, um, and I was looking around, and there were 50,000 fans in there. And it hit me. Come tomorrow morning, 44% of them will go back to work and be miserable. And how can it be that the same people who show this passion and who are there loving every minute of it, go to work and leave their hearts at home? How can we um, allow that to happen in our organization? So it's time to bring joy back into the workspace and it's definitely time for HR to get back into the human business. So um, Evan mentioned before, we don't want to use the term resources anymore. We have to focus on the human aspect um, of HR. And especially since that coincides with this paradigm shift that everything about work is changing and it's changing at an accelerated pace. So how we work, where we work, our understanding um, of work is changing. And that coincides with a different, uh, different trend that we see in the marketing field. It's that we as consumers um, are changing our behavior. So we are used to having an individualized experience. Some call it the Uberization, um, other people call it the Netflix effect because we're just so used to having that customized experience. And we're taking that, um, that expectation to our workspace. So we change our expectation as employees and we start thinking about work, about our jobs like consumers. And that's where the term consumerization of HR or talent consumerization uh, comes from. And it basically describes the idea of creating a social, mobile and consumer side and employee experience. And it has been coined as the most defining and disruptive uh, trend in our industry. And of course, our current approach to HR, our industrial area of thinking is definitely not going to get us there. So the question is, what's the playbook here? So how are we going to change that employee experience um, in our organizations? So first part is we have to think holistically about it. So the way we want to interact with our employees and what kind of consistent and immersive experience we want to give them has to be aligned. Oh, um, after all, it's sort of the ultimate expression of what your business values are, what your identity is, and what you stand for. And then, of course, we have to apply design thinking. So design thinking is really helping you to put you in the shoes of your people, the people you're designing for, um, to have a better understanding of the, of the situation. Because many HR processes today, they're really designed for those running the services, not actually for those who benefit from it be it employees, be it, be it leaders in the organization. So we have to start putting ourselves in the shoe of our employees and stop writing policies uh, to keep Douglas in check. So don't fall prey to the Douglas effect. Um, so Douglas is, is um, someone who embodies all those less desirable traits that we sometimes see in, in, in people. So stop designing for Douglas. Design for your best people, for the amazing folks that you have in, our, uh, in your organization and really create that inspiring and empowering workspace. 
The next part is to really instill those um, cultural anchors. Think about what you stand for and then be authentic and, and show your identity because that's one of the, what's going to differentiate great place, places to work from not so great places uh, to work. So create those responsive um, um, environmental conditions that help you decide what you stand for um, how decisions are being made so that you can be agile and, and nimble in what you're doing. Having quick um, decisions, but still staying true to your culture, to your DNA. And of course, uh, be agile. Since we are in the agile space here, it goes without saying um, that we have to embrace agile as the new um, business and leadership ship model. So how can we translate all those agile values and principles into what we are doing? And how can we create um, those stimulating interactive uh, work environments where people can do their best work? So we talk a lot about intrinsically motivated people, but how can we create a work environment that really suits, suits um, those people? And then last but not least, it's gamification. How can we gamify our HR processes, our HR um, services? And when we talk about gamification, it's really about taking the essence of games, all those attributes such as fun, play, transparency, uh, design, competition, and of course, addiction, um, and apply them to a range of our processes. That in the HR space, that can be um, about badges and points and leaderboards and learning and development, or um, it can also be about virtual reality and augmented reality in your um, in your hiring process. So there are different ways um, of applying that and creating those experiences, those individualized experiences for our people. And when we talk to um, leaders about uh, the fact um, that we have to create those experiences, 80% of organizations, they say they're aware of the fact that they have to do that. But only 20% of organizations say that they are doing a good job um, with it. So let's look into a couple of examples of how you could approach that. And, and I, I coined it the Agile, um, uh, the Agile Advantage. Let's talk about how Agile organizations um, start to change some of the things. And I just picked a couple of examples uh, to go through in the space of time that we have. So um, the first thing that we realize is uh, what we mentioned before, change your name and not just the name behind it but the way you treat people the way you define the way you coin um, your hr mandate so we want to go from from human resources um, to people operations so we really focus on the human aspect of it but of course that's not just the name change it has to be a game change as well so we have we in hr have to change the way we work to change the way we, we deliver value to, uh, to the organization. And um, for the actual folks um, in, in the call, this is really about bringing your actual practices like Scrum and Kanban um, to your HR base. So how is HR organized? How do we deliver value? But then um, HR has another part of it. It's not just about HR as an organization, but also HR as a discipline. So how do we create meaningful services for our people. So how do we bring actual, um, actual values? How do we take the actual mindset and translate it into everything we are doing for the organizations? So that's basically your HR for, for the actual organization uh, part that will make you uh, different. And then of course you have to talk about um, avoiding hires remorse. So you have to, people are never more impressionable than in the first 60 days um, of being in a company. And of course, you have to do a great job in, in connecting with people proactively, um, engaging them in, in, in the whole um, talent acquisition process. But once they, they sign on, we have to keep that engagement going. You have to make sure that they love what they are doing and that they get um, successes very quickly. And of course, there is nothing more inspiring for people than to be part of a, of a successful um, actual team. They get to present um, their results very quickly and, and um, be part of, of something meaningful. But there are um, other ways of doing that. Companies like KLM and Bosch and Heineken, they use um, onboarding apps to keep that engagement going, especially if you have a specific amount of time between hiring people and actually getting them, them on board. Um, but then, of course, you also have to talk about learning and, and um, development or learning and teaching. Actual ways of working are learning versus ways of working. So actual does not differentiate between work and, and, um, and learning. So learning is really embedded into the way um, you're doing things um, 
and it's also the, the teaching part of it that has to be there and we have to embrace those new ways of continuous learning so it's not just we send people on on a on a couple of courses and it's it's done no it has to be continuous uh, continuous involvement and of course you can think about things like fedex days or ship day ship it days where people um, do hackathon styles and, and really learn and share and you could also think about things um, like not having training budget but instead tell people okay you make your own choice we empower you to to choose uh, your training and learning events and, and move forward and of course, we also have to recognize the power shift that comes from moving away from command and control micromanagement to autonomy and, and empowerment. And with that um, shift, it's not just about making decisions when it comes to their work, but people are also in the driver's seat when it comes to their own development. So how can they um, bring themselves in when we talk about um, HR, uh, HR processes and tools? And last but not least we have to walk the talk how many organizations do you know and you might even work for one of those organizations who keep telling everyone how important people are and that people are their main asset but then when you see how people are treated in the organization you see there is a disconnect so we have to make sure that we walk the talk um, to give you an example um, patagonia the, the u.s clothing company they say we hire activists so they give employees social justice day to be activists. So they say we walk the talk and that's very important. That's what's going to shape your DNA. It's not just what you say, but it's really what you, what you do. And of course, there's so many great examples of, of agile organizations who disrupt the HR industry and, and have a different mindset of how do we treat people? How do we work with it? And we captured um, many of, of those examples in, in the article. Um, and you can, you can look that up. But when you read all these examples, these and other examples, um, we keep this in mind, best practices are probably the best somewhere else. So you can learn from that. Um, you, can, you can start being inspired. But at the end of the day, you have to find your own way. What might work for one organization may or may not work for your organization um, but it's important to get that uh, get that transformation on the way and start changing uh, that mindset shift and of course um, i'm aware that that's a huge transformation and hr has never had to go un undergo such a massive transformation as we, as we are experiencing now um, but there's a lot of value in it and we have to start uh, that movement going but of course we also want to ask what's in it for me um, it's a natural response for people to ask that question because they want to know okay am I on the right track why, why are we doing that so let's look into that question real quick when we talk about what's in it for me as an employee um, the answer is it's all about you it's all about creating those unique experiences um, for employees so we connect with people on a personal level we get to know them and we make make an experience that works for them and really inspires them but it's not just about employees it's also a, a difference uh, for for um, leaders they have to shift away from micromanagement and control and instead focus on inspiring and developing people and that's going to free up time as well for them them to really connect with people and help them help them grow um, as, um, as individuals. But I think the most important change is going to be for HR. Um, HR has been um, focused on turning away from being a cost center and fighting to prove their value to being a business driver. And with the actual movement, we can get there. We will be the business driver. We will be the essence um, of an agile, um, agile organization. And that's, of course, last but not least, when we talk about um, having high engagements for our employees, it's all about making the company grow and thrive because an engaged workforce is a successful full workforce. And the driver behind all this, these experiences and creating that different way of connecting with people, it's HR. And that makes HR the secret to business agility. We can make this happen. It's, it's up to us to change the way we connect with people and bring the human aspect back to people operations. So ask yourself, what is your contribution? How are you going to make a difference? How are you going to help 
to to win the, the workplace so that we can be successful in the marketplace think about how you can connect with people and inspire them and engage them so think about uh, your contribution and of course let's go rangers thank you so much all right thank you very much fabiola uh, I have to admit, if someone could make timesheets fun, I, I think I'd go back to working for somebody else again at some point. Um, I'd like to move on very quickly to Pia Maria. So I've been working with Pia Maria for the last year on the IC Agile, Agile Talent certification track. Um, I've, uh, she's also coming to New York. She'll be running a workshop with the Business Agility Conference, um, it, before the Business Agility Conference. So today she's going to be telling a story about motivation and why uh, intrinsic motivation is not the most important, the only form of motivation that matters. Rumiya, can I hand over to you? Yes, thank you, Evan. Hi everybody, I am Pia Maria Turen and I'm going to talk about intrinsic motivation today. So let's see if I can make this slideshow going as well. Okay, uh, what if we could wake up on a Monday morning and be thrilled about what's waiting at work? I mean, work consists of such a large part of our lives. It's at least eight hours a day, if not more. So we need to be happy at work and in life. And you know what? I don't believe at all in work-life balance. Why, you may ask yourselves. Well, if you speak about work on one hand and life on the other hand, like it's two separate things. The fact is that you have only one life. So it's crucial that you put some life into work as well. Uh, so I'd rather talk about life balance instead. You need to live all of the time, both at work and when you're not working. So employee engagement, as Fabiola just said, uh, that has become, together with motivation, a very uh, quickly has become the most important thing for most companies. And our definition at Green Bullet is to both be happy and to be able to contribute to the organization's goals. If you have just happiness uh, and you just feel good, uh, maybe you're not producing so much uh, results or achieving your goals, you're a happy sleeper or a slacker. And if you only create results all of the time, there is a great chance that you may be a crash and burner, actually. So to be engaged, you need both. And you need to create that direction for your employees to the top right corner on this slide. Engagement means both being happy and being able to contribute. And we know that in engaged employees will take care of the customers and make it possible to be profitable. Uh, and a profitable company can realize uh, that strategy and reach that vision or dream. Right, okay, so we all, I think, agree on, uh, on that. Uh, so how do we then accomplish motivation? Well, in his book Drive, Daniel Pink gives us his motivation recipe, which we often follow in agile settings. It's all about autonomy, mastery and purpose. He believes that these are the things that mainly motivate people. And I would say this is definitely a good start, but there is so much more. And not all people are actually motivated by autonomy, mastery, and purpose, but by totally other things. So there are many more motivators or basic needs, as I prefer to call them. Uh, if we take a look at empirical research, there are many more motivators that we all share, from power to curiosity, social contact, eating, tranquility, or physical activity. So these are the basic needs or desires that all people share, but to a different degree. 
uh, when we can live our values, we lay the foundation to a meaningful and happy life. So these are all intrinsic needs. There is no such thing as extrinsic needs, according to the doctor in psychology. He's called Stephen Rees, who made the empirical research behind this motivation profile. Uh, fact is that also extrinsic motivators uh, are intrinsic, such as money or a nice title. That person is intrinsically motivated by status, which is an intrinsic need. It's not something extrinsic that jumps on us. It comes from within. So sometimes we become very consumed by our daily business that we, we forget to take a look at the larger picture of who we are and where we are headed in life. People pursue their basic desires for no other reason than this is what they want. So they occur totally automatically. We don't have to think about it. They motivate everything you do, all your actions, and they show your deepest values, and they show what you need for value-based happiness. And they occur with a very different degree of self-awareness. Some people are extremely aware of their basic desires. Some have no idea. Uh, the empirical studies behind this was made between 1995 and 1998. And Around 8,000 people were asked anonymously in the US and Canada in North America. And then it was validated in Japan and Europe with around 1,000 people. And the questions were, uh, what motivates you? What makes you happy? Uh, what makes you tick, in essence? And there were clear statements that, that differentiate uh, people from one another. So Stephen and his assistant, Susan, collected over 400 different motives and they categorized them into the 16 basic desires or life motives and um, today uh, 110,000 people have done the RIS motivation profile which is really a very powerful tool. The first finding is uh, that the basic desires and answers the questions uh, what is the intention of your actions? Why do you do what you do? And the second finding is that you're motivated by these needs with a very different intensity. And this is what separates us from one another uh, and makes us unique, like a fingerprint. We are all unique creatures. And the third finding is that we all think that our own values are the best. And Stephen calls this self-hiding. So, there is no one really who knows you better than you. And who are you? And why do you do what you do? So we see a lot of people on this slide. What do they all have in common? Well, we can see they are in the same place at the same time. But they also share the same 16 basic needs but to a different degree. And this is what makes us different and unique. This is also the reason why some people have a difficulty to buy into agile values. They don't have the traits that characterize an agile person's value structure. This is all about value structure. Um, we'll briefly touch on each basic desire that all of us have. And the first one is actually power. Uh, and that is the desire to influence and decide. So you should choose an employee with a strong need for power, for a position of leadership. Uh, independence is the desire for self-reliance and to not need help from other people. So be aware that an employee with a strong need for independence may not function well in a team where decisions are made by consensus. Uh, the third one is curiosity, the desire for knowledge and thinking. Don't expect an employee with a weak need for curiosity to do well in a role that requires a lot of analytical thinking. And then we have social acceptance, the desire for inclusion. Uh, for these people, it's important to, to provide gentle feedback to employees 
who have a strong need for uh, acceptance and constantly praise his or her effort. Uh, order, the desire for organization. Be aware that an employee with a weak need for order will not enjoy assignments that require attention to detail. And then we have saving, the desire to collect things. Be aware that an employee with a strong need for saving may need incentives to get rid of unnecessary items such as outdated paperwork because they want to hold on to things. And then we have honor, which is the desire for upright character. Don't be surprised if an employee with a weak need for honor does not remain with the company for an extended period of time. Uh, idealism is the desire for social justice. And you could assign an employee with a strong need for idealism to a role that involves planning charitable activities for the company, for example. And then we have social contact. That's essentially extrovert people. Uh, and you should assign an employee with a weak need for social contact to a position that allows him to work alone much of the time because they don't want so much um, other people around. There is also a desire for beauty and you should allow, allow an employee with a strong need for beauty to decorate his workplace. And family, the desire to raise one's own children. Don't assign an employee with a strong need for family to a position that requires a lot of travel. And then we have status, the desire for social standing. Uh, you should reward an employee with a strong need for status with perks such as a fancy title or a desirable parking spot identified with his or her name. And vengeance or winning, this is actually the same need. Uh, they were correlated to a very large degree, so they are the same need. It's the desire to win and get even. So you should provide an employee with a strong need for vengeance with socially appropriate opportunities to compete and win. Eating, um, the desire to consume food, offer attractive food choices in the company cafeteria, which will delight the employees with a strong need for eating. And physical activity, the desire to exercise our muscles, uh, reward an employee with a strong need for physical activity with a six month membership to a local fitness center, for example. And tranquility is the last one. This is the desire for emotional calm. You should not assign an employee with a strong need for tranquility to a role that requires risk taking. And those are all the 16 basic desires. So we do not perceive reality as what it's like, but as we are. We think our values lead to the greatest possible happiness in life, not just for ourselves, but for everyone else as well. Uh, and when we realize our needs, we think we've learned something about human nature, but we have really just learned something about ourselves. So we see our own intentions, they are invisible to other people. We see others' actions, which are visible to us. Uh, their intentions can only be seen by themselves, unless, of course, they share their uh, risk profile. So the same basic desire at varying degrees of strength produces different, even opposite personality traits. Um, so the core of humans consists of 16 basic desires. This is the person without any environment, only the person, the core of, of the person. And this is the intrinsic motivation, why the person do different things in different contexts. And then you put a, a certain person in a situation or a specific environment, you see beliefs, rituals, skills, and behaviors coming out. Put the person in a different context and another behavior will be seen. Help each person to find the right task. This is lived respect for the individuality. And true success is really to be happy in life and live your needs to the fullest. So we really don't see the world as it really is, but from our own perspective, our own glasses, we see the world as we are. And by knowing more about each other's basic needs, we can create high performing teams that understand how to use every team member in the best possible way. 
And the necessary psychological safety is something that you get for free when you get to know your team. But the psychological safety presentation is another one. So, in an organization where we can create prerequisites for motivation and engagement by building them into the whole system, respecting that people have different basic needs, we have a greater chance of making our customers happy and loyal and be a profitable company that can realize that dream. In the end, the, the only thing for creating great things together is motivation and finding basic desires in people and being able to create prerequisites for living them inside the organization. The truth is that very little would be produced if we did not have any motivation. Um, you can read more about race motivation and many other things in my book called Agile People, a radical approach for HR and managers that leads to motivated employees. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you. It helped if I was off mute. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and it is a good book. I actually own a copy. So uh, definitely recommend it. So moving on to our last speaker before we go into the deep dive. Um, and that's when we open the, the floor to each of you. Uh, I've known Marsha for a little over a year. Um, we've had many, many a uh, late night or early morning uh, call over business agility and various topics, the, the penalty of time zones, I'm afraid. Um, but today she's going to be sharing her insights on curiosity and how to foster and build that within uh, your, your people. Over to you, Marsha. Thank you. Oh my, am I going to go? Yeah, I don't know what to do. Uh, screen. Don't no, there we go. You're up. Okay. Wonderful. So I was asked to tell a story today, and my story really is how did I become a business anthropologist? Why did I become a business anthropologist when there weren't any early in my career? And Really, it was motivated by some of the same things that motivate Fabiola and, and Pia Maria, which was, but it comes out through the lens of business anthropology, which is how on earth did basically what were a bunch of small bands of primates create this monster business that leaves people out? that leaves people behind. Now I was in graduate school in the 60s and 70s, most of you probably weren't born yet, um, and I was pondering this matter and uh, supporting myself by working in business. And I, I came to, hmm, here we are. I came to the conclusion that this was the most important thing I could do, was to investigate what, what does it take to include people in business, and rather than leave them out. And during my career, it's gotten worse. I mean, people were turned into trash in the 80s and 90s with what was at the time called downsizing or right-sizing, and I became more and more concerned about it. So I've studied with a number of neuroscientists and, and here, here's what I have learned that at puberty our brains are essentially programmed to turn away from what's new and turn toward what the neural pathways that were built up until that time. Um, if you can imagine yourself in a small group um, where you knew everyone your entire life, you very likely slept in a puppy pile with them, breathing together <laughs> for a fair bit of the portion of each 24-hour day, and you really knew what 
to count on them for and what they needed help with. You knew that you knew it deep in your physiology. During the time that the brain was evolving, this was the circumstance in which our forebears lived. There was virtually no social uncertainty. There was some uncertainty about such things as whether lions might eat our children. And that, of course, <laughs> gave rise to the inquiry that we now know as business agility. Question, how are we going to keep the lions away from our kids? Very likely gave rise to language and gave rise to noticing things like who has the strongest arm to throw stones, who can shout the loudest, who can jump up and down the highest, and who could get the kids up the tree faster. And there you have it. That's the beginning of what we call business. Now we're asking ourselves questions like, well, what about the people who don't want Alexa in their homes? In my inquiry during this time, uh, both on my own and with social neuroscientists, I am convinced that belonging Belonging is the brain's single most powerful driver. Uh, there's a no, there are a number of bits of evidence for that. I agree with my colleagues here that there is some variation about the extent to which people hunger for that. But let me say that social animals die of grief much more often than they die of hunger. There's lots of good stuff about that. There's a famous story about the orang and the dog, which you've probably heard. Uh, the dog would, both of them were dying, and uh, they happened to bump into each other in a, in a reserve, and here, here you are. This is what happens. <laughs> Somehow, don't know exactly how. Um, but here's what we do know, that, the brain's primary function is regulation. It, our brains are regulating our metabolism right now. Unfortunately, we're not all in the same room, so we're probably not co-regulating in the way we might if we were in the same room. But I'm getting some pleasure from being with my colleagues, and I'm imagining that everybody else um, in this webinar is also getting a kind of pleasure from being with our tribe. Imagine that it, it amplified, which is what happened during the time that the brain was evolving. So I am claiming as a business anthropologist that the value of all of the exchanges that make up our businesses is experienced with brain chemicals. We are all drug addicts. We love contributing. In this network of exchanges, which is now so much more complicated than it was during the time the brain evolved, we are still as vulnerable socially as we ever were because <laughs> our experience is determined by our brains, not by what's going on out there. And the human brain did evolve to keep us focused on cooperation and coordination. Um, you probably have lots of experience of that. I'm not gonna um, go into the experiments now, um, but emotions mostly are controlling our focus on exchanges with other people. Um, if people want more information about that, I can, I can provide it. I'll give you a little snapshot of a very powerful um, experiment in social neuroscience. Undergraduates were put in an uh, MRI, an fMRI it's called, 
and they were told that they were going to be throwing a ball with two other individuals and there's a screen with and they the students could see the two cartoons throwing a ball to each other and sometimes they threw it to the student and the student had the ability to decide which one to throw it back to and that went on for maybe a minute and a half and then the two cartoon characters stopped throwing the ball to the student and just kept throwing it to each other the re results were extraordinary people came out of the of the mri saying they didn't like me i felt rejected this powerful powerful drugs um so that inclusion is um that need for inclusion i think has probably driven many social attempts at certainty these are a, a, just a few on my screen uh, that amazed me as i was growing up uh, your third born son you'll be a priest to my baby boomer brain i was like huh how how is it possible that we invented a society that that ran that way and i i'm afraid that the answer is, is we get addicted to social certainty however we're living in a world where we don't where we don't get much of that the world we live in as you very well know is a world where the people who are trading with us in our business ecosystem are living in a shifting environment their concerns change their desires change what they value changes and we can either go to where many social animals go which is us and them well those idiots aren't buying our products what's wrong with them that's a little less popular than it was when i was in graduate school um however the ingenuity that i saw being undermined <laughs> is is not an easy thing to sustain and the reason for that is social uncertainty so let me explain what i mean by that <clears throat> in order to be curious about what's going on let's say with your employees or your suppliers or your strategic allies who seem not to be cooperating we have to have the skill to recognize that we're moving into us and them which unfortunately is a very very deep instinct it shows up in infants who are as young as three months old and it's pretty well there by the time they're six months old and it really inhibits um our ability at to uh perform in, in agile to 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 actually live an agile life when we are socially uncertain our prefrontal cortex shuts down any kind of uncertainty flight fight or freeze that's what we do when you see a bear unless you have been trained to be around bears you will do one of those three things whether it's the right one or not doesn't matter because your prefrontal cortex stops so <clears throat> i'm here to ask you what has to happen in order for you to continue to be curious and this is a this is an example that comes from one of my many uh, projects i'm not allowed to say the name of the company <laughs> funny um so i was working with an executive and he i gave him a a, a task to do 
And he came back and this is what he said. I, I don't want you to tell anyone I said this, but all the best teams have single mothers. And I have no idea why, I mean, you're gonna tell me why that is, right? Which I did, I said, yes. I can tell you exactly why that is. The single mothers are more vulnerable than everybody else on the team. And everybody on the team got curious about how they could take care of the single mothers. They were, they were better at coordination. They were better at collaboration than the other teams because they had somebody vulnerable to take care of. They got smarter. And that's what happens when we embrace vulnerability. So how do we do that in our businesses? How do we embrace vulnerability, which the brain doesn't really like? How can we do it on scale? How can we move away from us and them and get fascinated by vulnerability? And that's what I've been doing for the past almost four decades. <laughs> and I discovered that sincere inquiry is really a silver bullet that whether or not vulnerability is right in front of you like a single mother that actually has to be able to get to daycare before five o'clock or her baby is going to be outside by itself um we have other ways that we can sustain inquiry about vulnerability and i've essentially spent my career doing that how do you do that so for example if you have a really clear core promise, if your business has a really clear core promise, there's always the possibility of how we're going to fulfill that today, given the shifting concerns of, our, of the people in our ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> if they are empowered to do it, maybe, we can have branded rituals which as you know works very well uh, in agile teams they have they have ceremonies they have rituals in which they examine together yes we have to have rest and all this stuff that allows us to be physiologically okay rest is one of the big ones got to slow down got to stop multitasking and I'm gonna, you all are gonna have these slides so you can play with this. So what I've discovered is that we can do it. And there are many tools that I've developed and others are developing to help people stay curious and finesse uncertainty. So you all are already pre-sold on the ROI for meeting the brain's social hunger. I just want to say that from my point of view, the brain's social hunger, the deepest is for co-regulation with another human being or other human beings. Breathe with them, look into their eyes. Nothing will ever substitute for that. And if you do it, you will get all these wonderful rewards. My team is testing a new tool. If you want to, if your organization would like to in, in, uh, participate in this test, we would be delighted. Um, it, it which uh, is focused on keeping people curious about what's going on in this business ecosystem, and really, it is about the gift of curiosity, bringing the gift of curiosity to your ecosystem that's really all i have to say i am very grateful for all of the teachers and researchers that preceded me and here are a few easily accessible books for those of you who want more and there will be more at the business agility conference i'm going to tell some juicy stories about how i got curiosity going in impossible environments. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So now we're gonna open up the, there we go. Now we're gonna open up the, the floor to, well, pretty much everybody. So as I mentioned at the beginning, 
we're going to spend the next half an hour or so on this deep dive. This is for you to share your questions for the three panelists or each other, your challenges, how would you solve a particular problem, or your, or your own stories um, as to how you've built agile talents, um, uh, recruitment, acquisition, or empowerment of your teams. So we have a couple of hands up already. So uh, Claire and Brett put their hands up early, as did Serbi. So let me, I'm going to, um, here we go. So Claire allowed to talk, Brett and Serbi. So Claire, uh, you're all starting as mute. Are you still there, Claire? Do you want to kick us off? You're on mute, you, you have to click the unmute button. All right, Brett. They stop paying attention, Serbi. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, I, I was li uh, listening to Fabiola. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. Cool. All right. So, uh, first uh, question was uh, related to when we talked about you know uh, providing uh, enough environment and enough engage uh, some some kind of uh, uh, facilities to employees for making sure that they are you know happy at the work, they are engaged. <clears throat> so the challenge which I face because basically I'm presenting uh, the people operations department so when you mentioned about people operations i felt you know this is what right thing we've already done with it <laughs> so uh re renaming our uh, hr department to be people and culture and since in india we had more of the operations thing so we can call it people operations um so the next step was i mean we have been doing this uh, from uh, quite many years now that we have a good roadmap of you know how to engage people so we have been doing the fedex day and etc but uh, i can share my experience from the last year and it has been the case all the time whenever you know uh, we have to uh, really execute that plan uh, that the prioritization of the work gets hampered and hampers our roadmap and the last time uh, last year uh, in despite of planning for FedEx in a year, we were not able to do even single. <laughs> so that kind of a balance is always a problem that, you know, um, the product teams and etc. they want, you know, you know, productivity to be more emphasized than, you know, running through, through this, uh, um, you know, those roadmaps and those uh, activities that you want to do. So there's always a uh, time crunch that you face. So, and any suggestions on how we can do it more better? I, I think it has a couple of, of different uh, notions here. So, um, we often see that organizations are trying to do too much. So, mm. rather pick one thing and mm. really follow through than saying, okay, we're going to do um, four FedEx days if you're not sure that you can even do one. Um, so I think that's uh, that's an important thing to really follow through and not just say okay let's just try everything and and then not not do it properly and of course it's a case as you see with any um, other agile uh, practice you prioritize and if you say hackathons are a priority for us because it's a way to engage people it's a way way to learn it's a, it's it's a way to to have them collaborate on, on, on a specific thing. It, it's bringing that gamification to your learning and, and teaching and knowledge sharing, then you have to follow through. So I think that, that's sort of one of the lessons that we see, prioritize and then follow through and do not promise people that you're gonna do for FedEx days if you don't know. No, 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 actually it's, it's not nothing which is disclosed. However, you know, uh, the purpose, it, it basically whatever we plan, it has a, some, some kind of purpose behind it. So why we introduced the FedEx day was because we are the product based company and we have like very old technology since the product is very old. So it's not, you know, uh, we, you're not always, always uh, up to the mark for the expectations of working with the new technologies. 
So we thought that we we uh, we would be giving a chance for them to for the team members to you know uh, work on whatever they feel you know uh, uh, curious about or they want to contribute to. They they see some kind of challenges. So that is uh, one thing. Another part. Uh, 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 we are not able to hear you one. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, Kevin just raised a question, so I'll just move over to him and, and we'll bring up a second question for you uh, sure. a little later. Kevin? Sure. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Great. Just um, interested in, Fabiola, that question about the power shift. So, um, client where the employees and teams have adopted agile practices and processes very enthusiastically, but the leadership and management style is still command and control. So they're in a situation where they're finding it hard to let go, finding it hard to empower because they have reached their success through old older ways. And they're under pressure from their shareholders and stakeholders to deliver results. So the safest way, the safest path to delivering those results is in tried and tested ways. So they're not so, they're keen in, in, in word, but not indeed in terms of empowering and letting go. So I just wonder in terms of agile change processes, how do we help leaders and managers let go and empower and feel safe to, 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 to take on this, this such important role for them as leaders? Yes, you, you raise an important point. Um, I, we sometimes call it the MBA DNA. So we are just used from going through business school that that's the control and command management. Micromanagement is the way you lead organizations, of course, and that has, has greatly changed. And um, there is always this question for, for managers, what's in it for me? So why should I change? What's the, there is a lot of risk attached to that because I cannot longer fall back to, to this um, um, situation and say okay we've always done it that way so it's going to be successful um, this way and agile coaches have a huge challenge here because it's up to them to guide managers into making that transition and um, of course once they've seen what the team can do when they empower them when they allow them to make decisions concerning their, their own job that's going to change give them the, the quick success uh, stories and 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 be the, the eye opener to them so i think it, it's important to to guide them in, in that journey and then of course it's a culture a corporate culture um issue as well um where we have to change our hr processes we have to change uh, the way we see status in in organizations but it really starts with every single interaction uh, that we as, as agile coaches or, or, or consultants have um, with, with leaders to make them see a different world and say, okay, we're going to help you through that transition. And we know you have to jump into the deep, dark water, um, but it's going to work out. We'll help you uh, through that process. Yeah, I, and uh, I can add to that a bit uh, also. Uh, this is the most, the biggest challenge, as I see it, in big companies I've come across this, of course, many, many times in large organizations when we are running an agile transformation program, it's always middle management who, who are the biggest challenge. Of course, they have uh, the most to lose also. Uh, so it, it's about the value structure and it's about uh, how they have been acting for maybe 30 or 40 years and what has been successful for 30 and 40 years. You just... You don't just change it like that. So, uh, and they are motivated by probably by power, by status or by independence, which are value structures that, that don't uh, go so well together with the agile values. So if the company has decided to adopt uh, an agile value structure, then you need to require from management as well to behave in, in uh, according to that agile value structure, regardless uh, if they have other uh, values in inside themselves, or unfortunately, they probably have to leave the organization. Uh, Rena Hellstrom has been researching this in Filna. She also works with Agile HR about brains uh, of managers, and it's not always possible for them. It's physically impossible to think in the way that allows them to be agile because the neurons in the brain has created uh, such uh, tracks 
so that it's it's even if they want to it's it's sometimes physically impossible to change uh, so uh, yeah the, what i can say is that basic needs and desires and values are not the same as behavior and behavior is, is possible to change and if we are requiring an agile kind of behavior uh, managers have to comply with that or they have to go somewhere else thank you may i so i have the, the most powerful tool that i've used with this and of course people who are powerful are powerful because they like being powerful is game theory um that it is in it is what happens using game theory is because it's so new they have to build new neural pathways just to get through the exercise and there's many ways to help them build new i mean i use large red exercise balls and make people sit on them when they're talking and bounce up and down and that builds new neural pathways and then they can so new neural pathways are not that difficult to build but game theory i have found allows people to design a future that that allows them to win and it's just extraordinary in its uh, efficacy so there's many tools that's just one i like thank you all right has anyone is anyone else going to raise their hand i still have uh, my question ready yeah, <laughs> no. back to you, yeah. yeah. so um, another part was about empowering employees for you know giving them um, uh, chance to select the training and etc. So for for their own self development. So I would like to share my experience again for this part. You know, the uh, we have been doing the Great Place to Work surveys just to understand how the how uh, employees perceive whatever facilities we, that we are providing. And uh, the last year also we got a little lower score on the training and development part. And uh, we tried the same model as you mentioned. You know, giving them empowering them to choose the trainings. Uh, how about the expectations? Uh, because we proposed, made a proposal for that, and after that, there was nothing which you could hear from them. In addition to that, uh, I myself had created a lot of opportunities for them to be a part of meetups, the local meetups, where people share experiences with each other. So uh, there's no no one attending those as well from the team. So I mean, uh, what is the next step to it? Because you are giving all what you can do. So that's my challenge here. I can tell you um, what SIPGATE does, the voice over IP um, uh, company in, in Europe. Um, so they have no approval process or official approval process. Of if you want to do a training uh, or go to an event, uh, you ask your team. Is that it does the timing fit, does the content fit, and then the team approves. But what they are doing is they have something like the shipping days, or they call it uh, Friday mm -hmm. sessions, uh, where they share things that they've learned. And you have to share back with, with your community uh, what mm -hmm. you've learned during that training and during that course. And um, of course, when you're offering things, it doesn't matter what you do, you have to bring in the retrospective aspect to it. You have to reflect. Um, is that a great practice? Uh, did it work? Why did it work? Why didn't it work? Is there anything to do to course correct so that you can keep it moving? And of course, if no one attends, then you have to ask yourself, okay, why did no one attend? Was the timing not right? Was the content not right? And then include employees in that dialogue, but really make that reflection and not just say, okay, we tried it, it didn't work, or um, probably there is no interest. Maybe we didn't phrase it in the right way, so reflect on what you did. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and uh, could I also comment on that, please? Please. Uh, there is uh, also, I mean, uh, some people are not uh, used to taking responsibility, right? It's like they have a kind of learned helplessness, like a small elephant. When it's really small, you can have a very small stick and a chain and it will stay there because it cannot uh, rip up the, the stick from the ground, right? And then the elephant grows, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and the big elephant could very easily um, drag up the, the stick from the ground, but it still doesn't try to do it because it doesn't know it can. So it, it's the learned helplessness that you don't think you really can take responsibility or want to take responsibility for yourself, 
uh, because all your life you haven't been used to do that. You, you haven't been used to be asked uh, when, when something was going on or to make a decision or to be involved or you've always been told what to do by somebody else, by some authority, in, uh, first at home, then in school and they, then at work by micromanaging managers. Uh, and this is a, a problem uh, for people to suddenly, they are asking me, suddenly uh, they want to know my opinion and uh, how, how shall I handle that? I, I'd better not talk at all. I'd better just, you know, be quiet and, and don't do anything. Uh, so, so, yeah, it, it's a problem, uh, definitely. Uh, I'm not sure if Marsha has some recipe for... Well, uh, let me just pause there. And um, there's a few people putting their hands up now. So we'll move on and... Um, uh, we can we can come back if we need to. So, Stephen, you had a question, or a comment, or story. Hello, Stefan. My name. I'm uh, working in IT management consulting, so working with um, primarily with uh, CIOs. And um, whenever I talk with them about agility, um, first of all, they start with uh, technology and iterative processes, and then I tell them um, that agility is much more than that. Um, about career models, HR, about financing, beyond budgeting, all that kind of stuff. And um, we always end up with, um, how can I change something here? Because I depend on HR, I have to do what they tell me to do. And also I depend on finance. Um, if they go with their budgeting stuff, I just need to do the budgeting. So how do I get from the CIO to the organizational level to really enable agility within the, all, uh, the whole organization? Yeah, that's what we all are struggling with, isn't it? How do we take the agile values from IT to HR and finance and, and so on? And this, this is what I do on a daily basis, also struggle with in, in um, uh, right now I'm working with IKEA. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I try to bring people who can speak about uh, the values and the agility. I try to have sessions where I invite HR, we invite uh, um, finance to round table discussions about this and what are other companies doing, showing examples, references, uh, and so on. So this is really what, what you, you can't do more than you can do. And some people will never change, but the people, some people will. And um, it's, it's a constant uh, work going on, trying to convince uh, other people about the agile value structure and other people may not have that value structure and that makes it more difficult. So it's the same thing like with the management, I would say. And we see two tricks that, that usually do the trick. So on the one hand, you can invite HR and say, hey, we need your help. Um, and then you pose a problem like, um, hey, we're, we don't seem to be hiring the right people. What can you do? How can you help us? We need your help. So um, go, go to their status. Or the other way around is that you go and say, hey, what is keeping you up at night? And then you tell them how you would approach that with an agile mindset. So don't try to convince them that they have to go agile, but showcase what it is. So we sometimes call it the grassroots approach. So just tap into what their biggest challenge is and, and uh, try to help them see a different uh, different view. Or if you offer internships, um, offer them to, to one of, of, of your HR colleagues. So go and say, hey, um, if you have a young, a young st a career starter, send them over to us for a couple of months um, and they are going to go back with a different mindset and a different understanding of, of, of actual. Anything on that, Marsha? Uh, I would say that um, <clears throat> convincing people of our values is um, just the wrong question. That the question that I like is how can we use what we know about Agile to give them more of what they want? And so I've seen people in marketing, I've seen people in finance, I've seen people in research, I've seen people in all over organizations do that. Um, because what, wherever they're standing, they're, let's just say it's finance, they will have areas with which they are not satisfied. And you can show them how, an agile approach will get them more satisfied 
And um, so that's my simple answer. I think this is a very difficult nut to crack. Um, uh, and um, yeah, the, the most pressing challenge that we are facing in companies today to convince uh, the people who doesn't want to be convinced. They have a totally different value structure and they don't want to have agile. And they sometimes create some kind of resistance movement against agile. We have seen that. Uh, so they say, no, we refuse. We will not uh, be agile. And then it becomes a war uh, inside the organization. Uh, and and uh, then it's gone too far, of course. And you can ask yourself, what, what's the use of this? Why are we doing this? And uh, uh, how can we overcome it? Anything else, um, Stefan? That. No, that's fine for now. Thank you very much. I would, I would simply add that um, being outside the organization has served me well in situations like this because I don't come trying to convince one department to do it another department's way. I simply come asking the department, what do you want that you don't have? Let's get it for you. Uh, Nick Horney, because we have two of them here. Uh, do you uh, did did you have a comment there? You're on mute. Yeah, I've unmuted you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, just uh, a little perspective on this. We've been at this at Agility Consulting now for 16 years. Um, and I, I understand what you're saying, and I think the approach in Fabiola, I think you, you commented on this. So you can't, basically, I'd like to follow up to some of your comments that part of it is really speaking, speaking the business and uh, really understanding what is disrupting uh, the business that you are either in or you're consulting to. And if you can help identify their VUCA or their disruption, et cetera, uh, then I think you can start having a better conversation in terms of uh, how agility, and I think more broadly in terms of agility, not necessarily agile methodology, uh, as does McKinsey and Deloitte and, and many of the others that CEOs are paying attention to. So I think the better that we can speak from a business perspective and identify what's the disruption it's not only digital disruption, but uh, as we all know, there are all kinds of disruption that's going on right now. How can we best leverage that information? Then, if you get that attention in terms of the business leaders, uh, the CHROs can't help but to uh, follow along with that, help uh, rethink some of, the, um, some of the processes that they have in place, some of the processes that are barriers to uh, fully implementing agility, as a culture, as a mindset, uh, as business practices as well. So anyhow, it was, it was kind of a follow on to what Fabiola was saying. All right. Uh, Mr. The other Nick, Mr. Argel. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Nick Argel. And um, it's, it's been interesting hearing people talking about the challenges of getting the business to make investments in things. And one of the things that, I, that I've eventually realized is that the people who specialize in getting businesses to make an investment in something are the sales team. And if you get an opportunity to get yourself some sales training, I think it's really very worthwhile to, to anyone who's trying to get managers to give up something that they don't want. Uh, <laughs> one of the biggest things that managers don't want to give up is money. Um, and sales teams specialize in prying that out of people. Um, the spin methodology uh, sort of relates to what a lot of people are talking about um, in terms of it being a series of questions that you ask people. And if you, if you work through that process, um, it is situation, problem, implication, need is what spin stands for. Um, then by asking questions on those topics, you can get people to persuade themselves to do the things that you want them to do, which is often more effective than telling them things. I can, um, I can, well, first of all, good to hear a fellow Australian uh, at such an ungodly hour, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I can definitely 
the test uh, sales teams and some of the sales, the persuasion techniques and the influencing techniques that are taught to salespeople um, uh, is definitely something that can be learned by a lot of leaders um, if, for, the, for the power of good, let's just put it that way. Yeah. Uh, any comments from the panelists? No? Agreed? <laughs> All right, Serbi, you raise your hand again. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, as uh, Maria mentioned about, you know, different uh, motivation factors, and people are different and they are motivated differently. Um, I think uh, uh, be, uh, representing uh, that group who's going to work with the um, for the employees, I feel that you know this realization is there all the, all all the time that the employees are different, and uh, that actually creates uh, a challenge that how to satisfy everyone <laughs> or how to create that balance on offerings or uh, from the from the uh, this uh, people operations group that how should we make sure that everyone is happy <laughs> into that and, and engage so is there any kind of experience or kind of solution that you are working with this that okay uh, how can we ensure that you know uh, right motivation factors are hit all the time from for, for different people so yeah. how yeah uh, i think you you can build as many of them as possible, you need to build them into your system, right? Mm -hmm. Because you may not be able to, to make this motivation profile on the, all the employees, mm -hmm. uh, because that would be, of course, the, the best thing. If you knew exactly what is motivated this person, okay, this person is extremely motivated by eating. Let's provide really good food in the restaurant. Uh, but then you, you motivate everybody who is, um, who is motivated by eating, right? Or physical activity. We usually, we give gym cards to all our employees, not thinking about that maybe nine or 60% of them are not motivated by physical activity. Uh, mm -hmm. So they don't use them. So we are basically throwing the money in, in the lake, as we say in Sweden. Uh, or finding out that somebody is very independent it's also crucial in an agile team, for example, where everybody's supposed to be team workers, working together all the time. But maybe some people, they don't want to work together. They just want to work alone. Then it's crucial to know that this person is really not a team worker. And we make opportunity for, for, for the person to have his or her own room or work from home or, you know, contribute to their ability. And their, uh, so, you, so you take into consideration your motivation profile, when you design uh, a job, when you design a workplace, when you design the, the, the prerequisites uh, in the workplace and the infrastructure in the workplace uh, to all these um, motivators as, as well as you can. And then you talk to people uh, and you, the best is to do the profile because then you would know, and then you can have a discussion and really, you know, reward people in the, in the right way and give the right kind of tasks to, to be motivated and engaged. Because okay. we want diversity even in, we want diversity in, in uh, motivational factors and basic needs that gives a better result in the end. If the team has a diversity also in basic needs. I think that's a very valid point. Actually, you know uh, how uh, mostly we offer is that we we give uh, all the offerings to everyone in the team or all yeah. in the organization. So it is not that effective for everyone. So, and everyone would love to have all of them, but then <laughs> utilizing that is something which is a different story. Then, so yeah. I think that uh, makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I would say that Ricardo Semler solved this problem quite some time ago, and he did it brilliantly. He let everyone decide how they would measure their own contribution to the business, and he let everyone in the context of their team decide how they wanted to be rewarded for that. Um, and it, I mean, it. it <laughs> It, it worked amazingly well, and it still does. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. a very good... Uh... 
actually you know i tried it uh, once that you know um, just for the sake of um, because i was trying to um, um, disclose some kind of new perk so i am just for the uh, en- ensuring that uh, i take care of some of the understanding or, or some of the wishes that they have um, uh, to you know uh, line up some more um, perks and etc from for uh, for them in the future i just uh, talk about uh, what more do you want to be you know uh, provided by the organization so that you feel motivated and happy to be working here um so um, you find many many such I'm just um, gonna pause you there because we're we're running out of time we have a question okay. from Sharon what was ricardo's last name it's semler ricardo semler s e m l e r yeah S E M L E R. So there you go. Sean. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Just answers it on the chat. Um, all right, we're about out of time. Um, does anyone have any final comments? Nick, you put your hand up. Um, I was going to say that I really feel for for Serby, and it seems likely that she's suffering from one of two problems. One is that she's her work is not being perceived as relevant. The other is that uh, she hasn't built the level of trust that uh that is needed from that section of the business to achieve things and uh i'll leave it at that since we're out of time All right. minute, can i, can I leave everyone with maybe one one question to think about uh and maybe uh it is an opportunity for a future webinar uh, but basically it is about maybe a different spin or different way of looking at agile talent uh, because there have been books written by uh, by Younger and Smallwood called Agile Talent. There have been a number of other books really related to um, the whole changing world of work. And by the changing world of work, we're really talking about here not only full-time employees, but contingent workers or gig workers, as the gig economy has, uh, has been discussed quite a bit, as well as AI and robotics. So now we've got a dramatically changing world of work. Uh, Universities like uh, Melbourne uh, Business School uh, are launching programs that are focusing on the changing world of work and others. And I think it may be apropos uh, to at least have a discussion and a dialogue uh, around a different lens at looking at agile talent. It really is about uh, the world of work is changing so dramatically. Uh, There are estimates that by 2020, 40% of the workforce will be represented by contingent workers or gig workers. And with that said, uh, I think that has a dramatic uh, implications for the business world, but also business agility. So I'll shut up, leave that as uh, maybe a topic for a later date, but I think it's uh, it's rich with a lot of uh, potential information and discussion. Well, that it is. So uh, let me just touch on two final points. First of all, thank you very much, Marsha, Fabiola, Pia Maria, and to everyone who who took part in the deep dive and asked questions and shared your own personal insights. Um, the We won't be having a symposium next month because obviously next month is the Business Agility Conference in New York, which um, I would be remiss not to encourage everyone to come along to. Um, uh, and. Uh, I will send out all of the, the, this has been recorded, so I'll send out the videos, I will send out the slides, um, and of course a link to the conference. In April, we'll be doing another symposium, which um, we're in the process of organizing now, which will either be on agile uh, procurement and contracting, an important topic, but uh, it sounds boring, but it's actually really interesting, um, or um, on another topic to be decided by the community. Um, I would also, and thank you, Ania. Um, to your point, um, we are starting to look at launching an Agile Talent chapter of the Institute. And if that's something that you are interested in, um, message me and we can talk a bit further about it later. Um, so, final, thank you very much to everyone who joined. And thank you very much, Pia Maria, Fabiola, and Marsha. My pleasure. Thank you, Evan. All right, I'm going to stop recording and uh, you guys have a fantastic rest of your day.